What was this, uh, how far we got last time? So we'll start here. And what we were talking about is ways uh, to detect what comes off the end of a gas chromatograph, what comes out the column. And we've got many different types of detectors, some different sensitivity, uh, resolution, linearity, and so on. There's really quite a variety. But what's uh, by far the most powerful detector that we've got is to put a mass spectrometer at the end of the column. And we haven't uh, talked about mass spectrometry yet. We've got a couple of lectures uh, coming up on the topic. And so we're, we're probably could a little bit ahead of ourselves in a sense, but let me try to give you a, a description of this and hopefully it makes big sense for you. So when we run our gas chromatograph, when we run an LC for that matter, we end up uh, sampling whatever comes out the end of the column, and we get a, a peak fork of some kind, some shape, and so we're detecting a, a compound. And the, I'll show you one of the powers, like I say, that's unique to mass spectrometry, is that this is a chromatogram, so this is the output of the gas chromatograph. Each one of those peaks are at least one compound. And we took just this little bitty area that shows in between here, so we're between the 100 and 200, so it's just a little section. And if we would, if you could see this, it would actually be the orange line here. So the detector, the mass spectral detector, is coming along saying, here's a peak, oh, here's a peak, here's another compound, another peak. But the strength of the mass spectrometer is that if we start looking at this, the mass spectrometer helps us understand more what made up that peak. Is it one compound? Is it two compounds, three compounds? You might say that we have good resolution, we got fantastic resolution by mass spectrometry, but it's not perfect. There's over six million compounds that have been identified by the American Chemical Society. Now, what makes me think that 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 has whatever came out of my column at this time is one compound. It could be two, ten, it could be twenty compounds. And so normally we just get a peak and we don't have any idea what was under, what made up that peak. But mass spectrometry gives us the opportunity to look at the components of that peak. And the way it works is that the mass spectrometer, as each compound, each whatever lives, Elutes out of our column, it bombards what's elute out of that column, it gives it a high energy, it explodes the molecule into pieces. Mass spectrometry blows the molecule into pieces. And the pieces are unique for each compound. Where there's weak bonds, that's where the molecule breaks. And so we can tend to get kind of unique fragmentation patterns that we look at and say, oh, okay, we've got just one peak, but there's a little different timing here, something coming up here, there's something else coming up here, because the, the, the pieces change. And so the pieces are pretty uniform here, they're all from here, but by the time we get over here, now the pieces that we find are from this molecule and some other molecule. We look over here where it's a little bigger, we would think, oh, one compound, look at that, that's nice and symmetrical, but lo and behold, there happens to be one compound coming out here, and the second one coming so the mass spectrometer has the ability to look at those pieces and say, gosh, some pieces are following in this time frame. Other ones, it's a little bit offset. So there's other pieces that are in a slightly different time frame. And so it tends to look at those pieces moving together at exactly the same time. And it starts saying, ah, I've got two different things here. I don't have one for the compound. And so this is then a little more information on this because the mass spectrometer is finding these pieces, and it says, oh, that's good, but it doesn't really fit anything. But it starts looking at them and saying, wait a minute, these pieces are running together, these fragments, time-wise, and these pieces are running together, so it starts searching and saying, what can these pieces be? Oh, here's a perfect match. How about those other pieces that were moving together, these other fragments? Oh, they're moving together. 
So it has the ability to separate compounds, even though they're not truly separated. It can identify them in that manner. And so it's extremely powerful methodology. When we're looking at very complex systems, it's tough to get separation, perfect separation. With mass spectrometry, we don't need separation. And that can maybe make even the cleanup, the sample preparation, doesn't have to be so good. We can have other things there. Our machine is going to take care of these contaminants or other materials. So if that doesn't make sense to you, hopefully after we've done the mass spectral lecture, it, it does make more and more sense to you. But like I say, it's an exceedingly powerful uh, detector for a gas chromatograph. So that's, that's kind of the detectors that we use. And like I say, the mass spectrometer is our most valuable detector. But we've got other issues that when we do gas chromatography and liquid chromatography, any type of chromatography. Our purpose of chromatography is to separate things. I've got a complex mixture. I need to separate it into pieces so I can measure those pieces. That means I need to resolve one compound from another. I got to separate them so I can measure each of the things in the food. So this is a formula that kind of puts the, the factors together that influence our resolution, our ability to, to separate. And I'll mention just a, a little bit about these different factors and say what we can what we can do about them. And so let's kind of look at look at those terms. Key factors influencing efficiency. How do we make our column more efficient, our separation better? A very important factor in column efficiency is the size of the column we're using. This is the internal <coughs> diameter in millimeters. 0 0.1 millimeter, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, it's exactly the same column, same packing material, same material, a small column versus a bigger column. And this is our separating ability. The bigger the number here, the more efficient. And I don't care that you give me a number. Basically, if it's going up, it's good. <laughs> this is what we want. So as it goes down, it's bad. So what's happening? Small diameter columns, very tiny columns, very, very efficient. As we go to bigger and bigger columns, you know, bigger diameter columns, our separation power just goes down and down. And so, ideally, if we need separation, we're going to be using small columns. And you might say, well, that makes sense, Gary. Uh, we'll just use small columns all the time. Yeah. There's always a catch to it. <laughs> no, you don't get a, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? If you're going to get separation, you lose something else in the process. What you lose with a very, very small column is I can't put much analyte in there. It just overwhelms the column, it swamps the column. My separation goes to pot. So if I'm using a very, very fine column or a small column, my sample is very small and my sensitivity goes down. So I lose sensitivity, but I gain separation. So what's important to me? Is separation important to me? Is that the all important factor? Is having more material more important? So it's a trade-off, a knowledgeable trade-off you need to make. What? Small column, big column. In our laboratory, we tend to work right about here. 0.25 millimeters is the size of the inter size or the in inside of the column. I'll get it right there. That's a compromise. Not great, not horrible. But I can again put more material on here, more sample goes on, I have better sensitivity, better measurement. So, see, everything's a trade-off. Another thing that influences your ability to separate compounds is what kind of mobile phase do we use? The mobile phase I call a carrier, a carrier gas. It's carrying my sample along through the column. So, what kind of carrier gas? Now, I've got a different metric here. The last one I wanted a high number. Here I want a low number. So. Again, maybe uh, Pam will go through the difference be between these numbers over here. But just say, I want a low number for this metric. Okay. So what gives me the lowest number? Smallest number, that's the best separation. Nitrogen. Well, that's good, that's good. But this is the 
linear velocity. That's how fast that carry gas is moving, how fast my separation goes, how much analysis time I have. If I have a really slow gas break, right, that's taking me forever to get this done. If I decide I really want to get my analysis done more quickly, I can speed up the gas flow by taking my separation. But if I choose to do that, this is taking me forever. Wonderful separation. It's taking me forever. I can't afford to wait so long. I jack it up to something like this. Now, I'm not getting good separation. So nitrogen, ideally, is the best separating gas. But I can't afford the time. It costs me too much in time. So I don't use nitrogen. Most of our industry, most of our analytical labs work with helium. So it's not quite as good. So this is a little higher, a little worse if it's higher. But it's not a great deal higher. And look, I can go from 10 centimeters per second velocity up to 50 to 70 centimeters. I can really be trucking down an analogy. I can just run really fast down here. And I haven't paid too much. It hasn't cost me too much in separation. So nitrogen hurts me bad when I try to hurry it along. Helium isn't hurt, doesn't hurt nearly as much in terms of separation. But look at hydrogen. That's even better. So if I'm over here at 10 centimeters per second, I can get out to 80, 90 centimeters. Cuts my analysis time by eight or nine, a factor of eight or nine. Instead of 10 minutes, it's only one minute analysis if I'm out here rather than in here. And so this is what we use in our laboratory. We use hydrogen. That's by far the most efficient. I can push it and I can get data much, much quicker. Most people don't like to use hydrogen. They say oh, it's going to blow up. Well, <laughs> It doesn't blow up. It's really hard, actually, to make it blow up. Because uh, some of our detectors, we, we ignite the hydrogen flame, and if I don't have exactly the right gas mixture, I can't make that hydrogen burn. So it's really, I'm really comfortable with it. It's safe, and I can do my analysis in one-tenth the time if I just make that change. And by the way, hydrogen is clean. There's no contaminants. It's cheap. So if you go through our laboratory, every one of our instruments uses hydrogen as the carrier gas. We're looking at other factors. So I, I say this is a very, very small capillary column, and it's got a coating on the inside. So our, each of our compounds, as they go through this column, they interact one way or another with that coating to slow down or, or speed up the process. So we choose different coatings different coating type, and we also choose how thick should that be. <coughs> should it be a thick coating on the inside of the column or a thin coating on the inside of that column? If it's thick, I can put more sample on, I can get better sensitivity. If it's thin coating, I can get much faster and better resolution. So again, it's a trade-off. You use thick phase, you get I can put a lot of sample on, maybe so a lot comes out, easier to detect. If I put in thin, I can get better resolution, better separation. So again, it's always the trade-off. There's no free rides, unfortunately. And that's true of many, many things in this field. You make knowledgeable decision. What am I going to compromise? What's important to me? Separation important? It's a really tough separation. Is my separation easy? Now I pick a column and design it so that I can get this done in a hurry. Time, time is money in all cases. The idea of, well, how long should this column be? I think I said they run anywhere from, you know, that long to 100 meters. <laughs> okay. So, as you might expect, the longer the column, the more efficient. But every time I double the length, I double my analysis time. If I go from 1 meter to 100, it takes me 100 times longer to get my data. So, not a good deal. It's not an efficient way get separation. You want to use short columns. You want to get the shortest column that you can and still get your separation. Again, it saves time. So the question always comes out when you start making decisions, what's important to you? Is our separation really a tough one? Oh man, I gotta be over here. So this this uh, pyramid. But what have I lost to get my separation? I've lost sensitivity, a certain MOS speed, and I've lost capacity, how much I can put on. 
if I really want to collect a lot of material, and we do that sometimes, we we're interested in flavor molecule, we tend to identify, want to separate it and collect it, separate, collect, separate, collect, and then take it for NMR. So I really want to collect a lot of material for, so I have enough for NMR. Well, then what have I lost? I have lost these other two. So where do we work? Obviously we work someplace in the middle of this whole thing. And generally we have to compromise along these lines. If speed is the only issue, generally we design that way. If resolution is important, we design this way. So again, it's knowledgeably taking a look at what do we need and how should we operate the system. And again, when you, you look at many of the publications, Many publications don't necessarily think about speed. They don't think about money, especially academic institutions. But if you start working in corporate and you know, you're going to be paid so much getting for each analysis done, you care about those factors. So again, you don't just take what's in the literature. You give it some thought based on what you know, and you change it to optimize that if it doesn't seem to be the best for you. So this is a, the not the last section, but almost the, the last section. There's a little bit about troubleshooting. As I said, you're going to collect better data. You're going to do a better job if you understand how your instruments work. From start to finish, what is that instrument? What is each part of that instrument? And what's its purpose? So again, understanding the whole process and where the leaks are, or I should say leaks, say where the problems are that you might run into. Again, often run something that's just kind of a box that gives you a number. That's scary. Uh, that's really scary. And so we start worrying about what can go wrong. What kinds of troubles do we see? And it uh, probably shouldn't be a surprise, but 80% of the time we have problems. It's a plumbing problem. You know, the gas isn't going the right direction at the right speed. It's not what we wanted. And so a good person for gas chromatography is also a good plumber. You can fix the plumbing at home just like you can fix it in the gas chromatograph. And so getting that gas to go the right direction as you hope the right quantity is 80% of the problem. There's a leak someplace, a poor connection that gives you the kind of problem. 10% is due to operator error. Okay, you screwed up. <laughs> Another 10% is hardware. You know, the machine screwed up. Machine doesn't tend to screw up. I've got some instruments that are over 40 years old that perlite the kit and those things still run. If something goes wrong with those things, we messed up, not, not the machine. So again, we think about that 80% and the more you know about that machine, the less likely you are to get that messed up by that 80%. What do you do? Instrument quality control. So put in the instrument sample and look at the data. That's the precision of your instrument. So we'll oftentimes take a, a solution of some compound, we inject it in the gas chromatograph one day, and okay, this is what it looks like, that's good. You know, a week later, well, we inject it again, okay, that's good. But if we run it again, it's like that, we say, okay, something's wrong. So an instrument control, an instrument sample. So the ins we know the instrument is giving us the data that we want. That's not step number one. There's a difference between an instrument quality control sample and a method. I'm taking a pure compound, reference compound, I'm putting it in solution. I want to see, do I get the same response out of my instrument? For a method, I would put some kind of an internal standard back into my sample, go through all extraction, concentration, everything, all the handling, you know, manipulation, and injecting it into the instrument. So this goes all the way back to your sample and then checks, did you do the extraction the same way? Did you do the concentration right? Did you do every step of it processing? This one just looks at the instrument. This one looks at the entire method. And you've got to do both of them. If something fails, what failed? Did you fail somewhere in the extraction? Did the instrument fail? So again, for my students, they go through both of these and they go through them routinely. Does your instrument work? And as I mentioned before, um, you just treat these things as sophisticated instruments. You've got flow controllers, valves that turn, and again, you don't <laughs> do them gently because they are very sophisticated. 
pieces of equipment. They're designed to give you the flows, the right flows, the right rates throughout the system. And again, someone can come in that doesn't know the system and say, oh, I want to shut this off. Okay, you just destroyed a several hundred dollar flow control instrument. Seven twenty percent operated air oversight again. Running these methods of quality control certainly important. Hardware failures, like I say, that really seldom, seldom happens. 90% of our problems occur back at the injection port, at the very start of the whole run. They're up here, so here's our injection port. Here's where we put our sample in. I'm making a connection up here. I'm putting this rubber septum up here. Well, how long do you change it with the septum? You keep on injecting, you're poking holes with it in that injection uh, seal up here with a needle. Is it going to leak? You bet it's going to leak sometime. Well, you better think of that before it leaks. So, move to have a strategy, a plan for how often you replace that seal up here. There's another seal down here. We've got the glass to metal. There's a rubber o-ring that goes around this glass that makes a seal. I've taken those things out and they've almost been ashes. They've been dust. They've been in there so long under that heat and nobody's ever looked at them. If you don't get a seal here, you get leaky out of the system. So again, this is the high pressure area. This is where you're applying pressure on this system. There's no pressure at the end of it. Where are things going to leak? Where they're under pressure. So again, anytime you're having a problem with the instrument, first thing you do is take a look at this. Is that seal on? Is it on tight? If you put the seal too tight, you can squeeze that rubber down enough that it plugs the hole. And again, you know something's <coughs> Tight? Well, that's good. If it's tighter, it's really good. That's not right. <laughs> You'd use only hand tight. And can you learn that by using the equipment, by reading the manual? So how much do you tighten it in? Don't just, like I say, <laughs> do it gently as much as you should. Check these out. Check the seal down here. Check to see that, in fact, your flows are 3 mils per minute and 50 mils per minute if you're, if you're running it. So, again, these are highlighted, the, the, the places where we normally get leakage, we decrease replacing. And again, 90% of the time, that's exactly what I find. My grad students will come in and say, I'm not getting my data. Well, let's take a look at those three places that I haven't mentioned to them before. <laughs> but it doesn't you know, get driven home until you get in that situation where something, something goes wrong. And there's, uh, you can also have problems in the end. Uh, there is a flow controller on the end. There's a purge line here. But again, that's not the common problem. Our common problem is up here, here, and down here. So let's, let's say there's other uh, types of analysis. We'll go through some applications of gas chromatography. What types of uh, analysis do we use them for? Um, so we'll kind of go through some examples here and give you an idea of the variety. So in my business, I'm looking at volatile compounds, I'm looking at flavor compounds found in foods. What's really nice, if you can put your food into a nice closed container, have a rubber septum on top so you can sample it, let it sit there for 30, 45 minutes, and of course the volatile compounds will go into the air in your, in your jar. And what you'd like to do is just take a nice syringe, put it down through the septum, and suck up some of that air and just analyze that air. It's called headspace analysis. You're analyzing the headspace above a sample. Very, very simple process. The problem is it's not very sensitive. You think about it, it's, it's just not a very sensitive method. It usually doesn't work. How's that? The easy methods seldom work. It's nice when they do, but they seldom work. Normally, you end up having to do some kind of extraction, isolation, and concentration. Even though I can have a device that you know, will analyze or detect 10 to minus 12 grams, 10 to minus 14 grams, it seems like a, a little bit of sample, small sample. It's not. It can be a lot of sample in some of our types of analysis. Um, I might have mentioned a methoxypyrazine. That's a green pepper, bell pepper odor. One drop in 12 million gallons, and you will smell that. I, uh, I, I have a mischievous mind at times. I think of going over to Lake Calhoun and putting about 10 drops in there and, and seeing you know, the newspaper about the Lake Calhoun smells like green peppers. And you go around snickering for a while. 
I haven't done it yet, but if it ever turns up in the newspaper that somebody says Lake Kelly smells or is one of the lakes smell like Ian Pepper, I probably would probably do it. <laughs> but so we oftentimes do have to concentrate just because flavor compounds are so potent for us. So headspace, I love it. It doesn't work for us most of the time. Most of the time we have to do some kind of extraction, concentration process. And so how we extract, how we go about it, really depends upon the sample. It depends upon what we want to do or need to do with that data. And again, sample injection, separation, again, kind of depends. It really depends upon the analysis you're doing as does the data stream analysis. So you really have to think about this. Sample preparation, like I say, we love to do what we call static headspace. We love to just put it in, take a syringe, Injected. Most of the time, it really doesn't work. And so we have to have some way to concentrate our sample. Concentrate whatever moves into that headspace, what's ever up in that air above our sample. We need some way to concentrate it. And we have two techniques that we use for that. One is SPM, in solid phase micro extraction. I hope that shows up in one of the next slides so you don't have to remember that. So solid phase micro extraction, or there's a commercial name for a twister. It's a stir bar, and again, I'll show you how that how that works. So we'll give a little more detail on each of these coming up. So don't worry too much. So static headspace, a way to concentrate this headspace in your sample. Dynamic headspace. Now we're actually going to pass air, or hydrogen, or helium through our food sample as we pass this gas through our food sample, some of the aroma gets trapped in that gas and gets carried out. Now I can do this for 10 minutes, I can do this for 40 minutes, I can keep on getting more head space, more head space, that I'm just flushing out of my sample. And what do I do? I pass what I flushed out of the sample, I pass it through an absorbent. So, if I go through an absorbent, my aroma compounds get trapped on that absorbent. So I can run a liter, I can run 10 liters of gas through my sample and collect everything that I, I get on a special absorbent. So it can be an absorbent, but again, these techniques also can be used. So we'll kind of look at each of these. Liquid injection, that's always nice, but again, we seldom get to do that. We have to go through a lot of isolation procedure to try to get flavor out of the food and actually have our flavor in the liquid to inject that food. Solids, again, they are very much of a problem but can be done. So let's look at some of these methodologies in a little more detail. This is called the SPME, solid phase micro extraction. And this is a special, kind of odd looking syringe <laughs> because it, it's set up in a way that there's a sheath down here, a protective sheath, and there's a plunger that comes all the way down through that sheath and that can actually be extended into the sample. So I guess that showed up a little better over here. So this bottom part, this expanded part here. And so what we can do is we can take the syringe, we can push it into a bottle that has our flavor, our food, whatever in it, and then we push this center plunger out. This is coated with an absorbent. So now any volatiles in my sample start saying, okay, I'm going to start moving on to there. I'm going to start going to concentrate, so they concentrate on this new bullet. So this is, and there's different coatings that can be put on that give us different attractions for different types of molecules. So we let this sit in the headspace of our sample. So we've got our jar, glue down below. Headspace, if it's in the headspace, and we can do 10 minutes, 20 minutes, we have 40 minutes. So we're just allowing our sample to concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Then we pull the plunger back in so it's protected. We pull it out and we put it into the gas chromatograph injection port, push that needle down again. So this is now in the 250 degree centigrade area of our gas chromatograph. Whatever we absorb is going to be heated, it's going to be driven off and into our clear. So it's a technique that's fairly commonly used. It certainly has its purpose. It's quite very well. 
the twister is the second one. So it's what I mentioned. I mentioned it's reaching through steam for head space with a jar or twister. The twister, like I said, is a trade name. It's a registered tape uh, trade name. Some people call it a stir bar. That's a more generic name. So you call it just a stir bar. But this is um, well, a normal glass stir bar. Magnet inside, so magnetic stir bar. But what's really nice is we can coat that with an insulator. And that's a polyimethyl silane. So it has a coating on the glass. Now that coating loves aroma compounds. It loves volatile compounds. So I put this in the head space above the sample, or I put it actually in the sample and let it stir. Flavor compounds, volatile compounds are going to be absorbed onto or into this coating. So instead of having this little needle with the coating on, I've got a spur bar that has quite a bit of coating on it. It's a thicker, thicker coating. And so there are some resin, uh, let's say, limitations. We don't like fats, samples containing fat, because the fat likes that coating. Oh, that's not so good. Now I'm putting fat into my gas chromatograph. My gas chromatograph doesn't like fat. So, so much for that. So, we can do a liquid. We can put it in the liquid if there's no fat in it. We can just take the headspace above the sample otherwise. And so, we take this stir bar and we end up <laughs> doing it different ways. But we can, one thing we can do is we just open the top of the injection port of the gas chromatograph, so it's 250 degrees centigrade there, drop it in, close this, and arterial gas comes through and flushes the sample into our system, into our gas chromatograph. So there's different ways to do that. There's automated systems to do it as well. So in then maybe another thirty, forty thousand dollars you can do it automated or we can do it manually for nothing from there. <laughs> so you'll say we do a lot of the manual ones. Much but it's a, it's a nice system. It's more sensitive than our headspace. It's more sensitive than our steaming fiber. It is easy to use. So it gives us a good deal of sensitivity, a good deal of humidity. Our disadvantage of this is that we've only got one coating. For the, the steaming, I can put, or they can combine many different coatings for that, that needle. I don't know why. For this, we can only get one coating. So we don't have the flexibility. We can't tailor make an adsorbent or we can't tailor purchase an adsorbent that loves the compounds we want to measure. So that's certainly a limitation. We can't do anything with, with fat. The idea of dropping this in the injection port, well, we do that. But then it kind of takes a while to warm up. And while it's warming up, some things are being eluded off the column. Some things aren't being eluded off that column. And so we can end up peaks that are kind of broad. So that's not convenient for us. So oftentimes what we have to do is we have to put this in the heated area, have a device that is cooled with liquid nitrogen, so everything that comes off this goes into a liquid nitrogen cool section. So we, we basically freeze everything out here. After this has had enough time to unload onto this hole shaft, that gets heated in a matter of one or two seconds up to 20 degrees centigrade. And then this goes into our gas chromatograph. So oftentimes, we really need to focus everything. So desorbing is difficult. The idea of slowly desorbing, trapping the joint, and then analysis is the best way to go. In terms of uh, applications, so we've just got some a few applications to look at. What have, what have we done? Um, of course, they tend to be flavor biased. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, must be from prejudice in the instructor. But anyway, flavor production. So one of the goals that we have is producing flavor compounds that are natural. Natural. We can do things artificial, but nobody likes artificial. Everybody likes natural. So we're going to produce flavor compounds by fermentation. Fermentation is natural. So, okay, let's take this particular microorganism. And that microorganism has the, the weird uh, capability of fermenting oleic acid to delta decalactone. Delta decalactone is coconut. You smell that chemical, it is coconut. So we've got a microorganism 
You give it a little bit of other nutrients, give it some oleic acid, and it's going to produce coconut for you. Okay, you have to extract that out of the fermentation broth, but you have a natural source of coconut flavor. So one of the problems is, though, that many compounds exist in a chiral form. They may be an R or an S form. And the problem is that the R may smell exactly like coconut, the S may not smell, even resemble coconut. Same molecule, just a different optical isomer. We're very specific about that when we look at our nose, our ability to detect. So we've got to have some way to measure. What did the organism produce? Did it produce the R? Did it produce the S? Or did it produce both of them? And that's where the gas chromatograph is very, very useful, because we can separate optical isomers by gas chromatography. So this is kind of the, the process, the culture medium. So we had 220 mils of this culture medium. We gave it uh, all the things that we wanted in order for the organism to produce our decalactone. And so then we want to do analysis. So we take our culture medium, 220 mils of medium, we extract it with diethyl ether. So it's five extractions, separatory funnel, so 220 mils in, put in 40 mils of ether, shake the heck out of it, collect the ether, add you know, more pure, clean ether, shake the heck out of it, <laughs> pool them together. Do five extractions with 40 mils, we've extracted our lactone. You concentrate that down to about 0 0.2 mils. So we have 200 mils of ether. We concentrate that to 0.2 mils. We run it over a fractionation column. So this is a column to try to get just the lactones together. So we put it over, you know, just a typical column, glass column with a silica gel. We get fractions off it. We do concentration and do GC. And so a lot of cleanup, a lot of extraction, a lot of pain in the butt when you think about what it took to, to get to there. But in the end, you can then run that decalactone, delta decalactone, and you can actually get a chiral separation into the R or the S form. So that's not an easy separation. Chiral isomers, they can be exceedingly similar in every physical property. And so you don't have much to go on. But we have the ability, again, in gas chromatography to make a separation of our chiral forms. And again, you can get a breakdown, like I said, of the different chiral forms. It's tedious, no question. Residual, so we got one tough one, we got one easy one. How about the presence of diphenylamine on apples? Diphenylamine, it's used to treat apples to control apple scab. Well, there's a limitation on the residue of this chemical that can be approved um, for use. So how do we monitor this? How do we make sure that somebody's not using too much of this diphenylamine, overloading it? It's not something you eat every day. It's not something that really belongs in your food supply. So let's make sure there isn't, you know, this we're within legal tolerance for it. And so typically apples are dipped in a solution of the diphenylamine, one gram per kilogram. And again, we are permitted to have 10 parts per million. In the US, the FDA says, after all the full process, soaking, drying, there can be no more than 10 parts per million residue of this <coughs> diphenylamine. And so this is really a simple one, like I say. You simply put the apple <laughs> into a solution of organic solvent hexane, for example, so put the apple in the hexane. The hexane will dissolve the diphenylamine. Concentrate your hexane, so extract your hexane. I'm sorry, get your hexane out. Concentrate it for gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And that can be done in different ways. I'm not going to go into the, the different methodologies, but concentrate in a way that you're not going to evaporate your diphenylamine, so you evaporate it very carefully. It's, question? Or? Yeah, no. So 
three minutes open hexane, concentrate injection into a gas chromatograph. And this is the surface of that apple, by the way. These are all the chemicals that are found on the surface of that apple. Somewhere in here, there's diphenylamine. One of those peaks is diphenylamine. And so what you would normally do is use a mass spectrometer. Say, okay, let me pull this one to bits. Okay, those bits like like that phenylamine bits? No, okay, no, 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 no. One of these are gonna blow into bits by mass spectrometry and they have the right bits that match your diphenylamine that makes the compound. And there's different ways we can go ahead and, and look for condensing. One way is like I say, looking for bits that are thrown into it. The other thing is, this is a mass spectrum of diphenylamine. So these are the pieces. Diphenylamine, if it's blown into pieces, there'll be a fragment, a piece of that molecule it has a mass of 51, 77, 93. So these are all the masses of the pieces that diphenylamine is broken into, blown into. 169 is the most abundant. So the fragment with a mass of 169 AMU is the most abundant one. Let's just look at our, our chromatogram. Let's look at our chromatogram and look for what molecules happen to have a piece, a fragment of 169. So we generate then a chromatogram, but only measuring for the things that blow into a fragment of 169. If we take a, a look at it, this is <coughs> our time across here. So if we go back to this schematogram, we, here's our time here. One of these peaks is our diphenylamine. We take a look at it. This is the diphenylamine over at the end here. And that's about 18, 19 minutes. So if we could go back to around 19 minutes, we find a peak for the diphenylamine. And so here's our apple extract. 169 is in this molecule that blue is around 16 and a half minutes. Okay, but there's also a peak here for 169 that's out here that goes to 17 and a half minutes. And so this is it. How do we know this is the right one? We take our apple extract, we add a little bit of pure diphenylamine, inject it again, ah, it's bigger, good. It increased, that's the right thing to monitor, and so we monitor it here. So we've got actually a fragment of that in our apple extract. And we can quantify that. So we use gas chromatography through separation. We do mass spectrometry to make it simple to identify what's what. Fatty acid profile, if that sounds familiar, it should sound familiar. You haven't done it yet, right, yet? You have today? What's up? Yeah. Next week, okay. So this is what you're gonna be doing next week, fatty acid profile. Interesting because the Really the only practical way, simple way, to determine a food is saturated, unsaturated, polysaturated, to meet label requirements is to do this by gas chromatography. So remember our triglycerides, our lipids, mainly triglycerides. You got three fatty acids on the glycerol backbone. Well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna break those fatty acids off of the triglyceride, and you're gonna make an, an ester of them, because the esters are much more volatile than the acids themselves. So you're gonna break off the acids and you're gonna make an ester. Now the esters are what you can actually measure just because they're easier to do. So you isolate the fat in one way or another, maybe for solvent extraction or sock slick or other methodology. So we do ahead, go ahead and do this isolation. And then you take the fat that you've just isolated from your food product, add three mils of boron trichloride. So I think that's probably the process you need to use for making the ester. Two drops of fat, 20 mils times two. So put your fat in there, add three mils of this reagent. Cap, kettle on line, put the tube in boiling water for one hour. Cool, add three mils of distilled water, 10 mils of hexane. Decant the top layer. You're gonna go through this whole process, the, the steps you're gonna go through and that isolates now the esters <coughs> from your sample. Inject approximately two microliters into, into the gas chromatograph. And what you're going to get is a chromatogram that looks like this. These are now esters on your fatty acids. And so you'll get an uptake for each fatty acid. 
We've got C with 18 is here, so 18 carbon fatty acids, 16 carbon, 14, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4. So, butyric acid, sulfuric acid, sucrose, and so on down the line. So, then, your instrument is going to give you an area under each curve. An area under the curve is proportional to concentration. And so, you will get a printout that gives you the area counts. And based on those area counts, and we've got C4 through C18 to three double bonds, you can figure out the proportion of each of these fatty acid bases in the sample. So you will go through these, these calculations. This is a, a vegetable oil. Vegetable oil has got a little bit of C14, a little bit of C16, palmitic acid. And again, here, your C18, saturated, unsaturated, same thing. So this one, Back here was to be a, a milk sample, dairy, has short chain fatty acids. This would be more characteristic of vegetable fats. Really, no short chain fatty acids in your vegetable fats. They're all C16, really, and, and C18, so different amounts. And this is a kind of that area expanded a little bit to see uh, a little better where these um, <coughs> peaks are and separate. The C18s, it's hard to separate you know, just one double bond. So C18, steric acid, no double bonds. Oleic acid, one double bond. And so that's steric acid, no double bonds. That's with one double bond. There's your peak. Got two double bonds and three double bonds. So again, it gives you the ability to separate the individual fatty acids. And you simply go ahead and look at them. You label them which ones are which based on running the internal or the standard compounds, and you can go ahead and calculate the area. The area percent corresponds to the percent of each of these fatty acids in your sample. So again, you can use the area and figure out what the percents are. And this does it for you: 25.5, 16.6 of C18, 40.97 for for lake acid, and so on. And so. It really it works exceptionally well for this. There isn't a, a better way to do it. Um, fairly quick, and I would say pretty simple. Well, those are the, I guess what I wanted to say about gas chromatography. We'll hit up mass spectrometry when I wander back. <laughs> but if you got any questions at any time, um, I'm down in the lab. You know, always come and find me. I want my your attention one more minute. Thank you. I give you. Yeah, good. <laughs> just just one more minute before you leave. I want to make sure that you know what lab you're doing next week. So please take note of this. Groups A and B on Monday will be doing the HPLC lab. Groups C and D on Monday will be doing the GC lab. Groups... Um, E and F will be doing GC on Monday, and groups G and H will be doing GC lab on Wednesday. Okay, what's that? What's that? Okay, uh, how about I'll just send you an email with the groups and the names in the group, and again remind you of this. But just be prepared, the HPLC labs. You'll see on Canvas, please give me one, one minute of your attention, Alex. Okay. On, on Canvas, you will find under Lab 4, one pre-lab quiz. In it, you'll see HPLC questions and GC questions. Solve only the questions for your lab. Next week, you solve the set of questions for the following lab, okay? So that you don't get confused. Um, I'll send you reminders of the labs again, but you will be doing terpene as HPLC lab analysis and free fatty acids as not free, the composition of fatty acids in different oils as Gary was explaining. Okay, I'll send you an email with all the details. Goodbye. <laughs> happy, happy weekend. <laughs> Thank you.